This is Mike Roth. Welcome to the Open Forum in the Villages podcast. In this show, we're going to talk to leaders in the community, leaders of clubs, and interesting folks who live here in the villages to give perspective of what's happening here in the villages and information that I think all villagers should have. We hope to add a new episode every Friday morning at 9 o'clock. This is Mike Roth. I'm here today with Christy St. John. Thanks for joining me, Christy. Thank you very much for having me. It's delightful to be here. Good. And uh, as always, I'm going to start today's show with a little joke. What type of key opens a banana? I have no idea. A monkey. Ah. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, l- let me give you folks in the audience a little bit of a background on Christy. Christy was born in Nashville, Tennessee, when it probably wasn't as busy as it is today. Very true. And she's had a, a varied career and lived in various places. She left Nashville and worked in residential real estate in Florida, okay, the energy sector in Texas. She then moved to Sicily for three months, Rome for two months, Florence for three months, where she attended, you can pronounce it, Christy. Università di Siena per stranieri. Oh, on a grant from the Italian government to learn language. Pedagogy. <laughs> pedagogy. And, and why don't you tell our audience what that word means? It's the teaching uh, philosophy and theory of teaching languages. Okay. Well, not even just language, it's everything. Yeah, it seems like Christy couldn't stay in one place very long That's because right. she then moved to Nice, France, where she taught for seven years. And she she was the first in marketing for a Lebanese company. Then she was in oil and gas trading for a small Italian oil company. Somehow she wind up at Vanderbilt University at the Owens Graduate School of Management in 1997. How do you wind, go, go from these international positions, Christy, to Vanderbilt University in recruiting? Well, I moved back to Nashville because my mom was ill and I'm an only child. So we left Monaco and came to Nashville and I couldn't find a job. People were saying, oh, that's real interesting, honey, but can you type? And I said, no, I can't. So I decided to do a PhD in French and Italian, and that's what I did. That took me to Vanderbilt. And from there, I was recruited to the business school because they wanted someone with an international background. And since I had traveled and been to lots and lots of places... And I convinced them that I knew the difference between Goldman Sachs and Sachs Fifth Avenue. They hired me as Director of International Relations. And that's where the career in higher ed started. Mm -hmm. And then you were recruited by the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. There you were a Associate Director of Admissions and Recruiting. Exactly. Senior Associate Director of Recruiting. And I also worked with international students there. So I continued on the path of working with international students, but also some domestic. And then you did something I tell my... I used to tell my coaching clients never to do, to go backwards. You went back to Vanderbilt. I did, but it was a promotion. Oh. Instead of an associate director, I was the director of admissions and recruiting at Vanderbilt. And I stayed there for another five and a half years until I decided to retire. Mm-hmm. So you retired pretty young. <laughs> yes, at least. At 23 or so. <laughs> exactly, yes. Okay, I got it. <laughs> what made you move to the villages? I had visited a friend down here who'd moved, and then another friend moved down here. And I thought, well, at least I know someone, and it looks like an active, fun place. I thought, I don't want to be in one of those very sad places where people sit in a rocking chair in their diapers and drool until they die. So I came down here, and I have been as active as I have ever been in my life, doing everything that comes up. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to miss anything. And one of my friends asked me the other day, she said, do you ever rest? Don't you ever sit still? I said, no, I'm out running old age, and so far I'm winning. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. How many clubs here in the villages are you a member of or participant in? Uh, Classical Music Club, the Jazz Club, the Mercedes-Benz Club, the Women Doctors Club, and I was with the single Baby Boomers Club, and I've dropped that, and let's see what else. I also go to art classes, and I'm learning to play bocce and a pickleball. Oh. And I'm going to go horseback riding as well. 
We don't have many horses here in the villages. No, but there is a place out past the colony that a friend of mine told me about. So another friend who has also owned horses, she and I are going to go out there and do some trail riding, and I'm going to learn to ride again because it's been probably 30 or 40 years since I've been on a horse. Oh, okay. So you know how to ride. But barely. Barely. Okay. I've ridden horses. Yes. I've worked around horses. Yeah. I prefer to skip horses. <laughs> They're the biggest, what do they call them, prey animal in the world. You call them a prey animal? A yes, horse? Yeah. Why? Because other animals will try to hunt them down and eat them. Oh, they're not. I, I see what you mean. And, and their their mentality is that of a prey animal. A little different than a lion, tiger, or, or elephant. That's true. You've traveled a lot around the United States. How many states uh, have you visited, Christy? In the U.S., I visited, I believe... All but Idaho, North and South Dakota, Montana, and Iowa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And oh, in ha- Hawaii. Well, I haven't been to Hawaii yet either. Hawaii is beautiful. I've been there a couple of times. All my friends say that. Yes. It, it, it's worth a week or 10 days in there. Mm-hmm. And how many different countries have you visited? So far, I've been to 78 different countries. And the next on my list will be Australia and New Zealand. hmm Hoping to go there next year. Okay. And how many foreign languages besides English and Southern Nashville, do you speak? Southern does count. I know. You all have to speak Southern. Yes, we do. (laughs) I speak, well, I started out, my first language was actually French because my grandmother had immigrated here and she spoke French to me when I was growing up, which was lovely. Then I learned Spanish in high school and followed up with that in college. And then I also learned Italian, which was perfected once I moved to Italy because I had to get by there. A lot of people in Sicily and some of the smaller areas I was in don't speak English. So it was an immersive experience. It was great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, when I normally run into people who speak many languages and have visited many countries. Mm-hmm. Can you guess what my first thought about that person is? No. CIA opera. Oh. <laughs> that would be interesting. But no, I'm not a very good spy. Okay. Well, I've met a few of them who, who really were here in the villages. So how did you get from crude oil trading to higher education? When I left Houston and moved to Italy and then France and then to Monaco, where I worked, I was... Hired mainly because I spoke Italian, French, and English by this very tiny oil company. And as I said, when I moved back to Nashville to take care of my mother, there weren't any jobs in crude oil trading there. Not I too much crude in Nashville? Not a lot of crude oil. There are a lot of crude people, but not a lot of crude oil. So I, I really didn't know what to do. And then when I was recruited to Vanderbilt after I finished my PhD to the business school, it was a whole new career. I got to travel all over the place and meet these really wonderful, interesting students. And I've kept in contact with most of them. Some of my first class graduated in 1999, and I'm still in touch with them. Mm-hmm. We're, we're friends on Facebook and LinkedIn. We don't communicate every day, but it is lovely to know that I have people all over the world, from Azerbaijan to Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you still working? I'm working part time. Yes. Now, I'm on the I'm other asking side. what 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 business? <laughs> well, in higher ed still. Okay. I am what's called a higher ed consultant, and I work with students who are trying to get into business school now. So instead of being on the the other side where I was deciding whether I was going to let them in or not, now I am trying to help them prepare to be accepted at some of the top business schools. And I work with about eight to 10 students at a time through the rounds. Uh, the application rounds are in September, January, March. So my busiest schedule is in January, February. I work with them and help them get their story. I work with them on their essays. I work with them on their interviews. And I get to know them very well. And again, it's exciting for me because I'm learning about all sorts of things like non-fungible tokens and bitcoins and Things I would never know about otherwise. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you, how do people find you as a consultant to help them get into a business school? I work with a company that's been around for about 20 years called Accepted.com. I know the woman who founded it. I had invited her to talk 
to visit us up there when I was working at Tuck. And when she heard that I retired, she said, would you like to come to work for me? And I thought, well, yes, why not? Mm -hmm. So I, I set my own hours. So I play golf in the mornings, mm -hmm. and then I generally work with my students in the late afternoon or evening. Mm -hmm. So you work with students from all over the world? All over the world. In multiple languages? Well, no, they all have to speak English. So we, can, we make sure that they speak English well. Okay, that, that, that's good. Now, you said that you moved back from Monaco to Nashville to take care of your mom. Yes. And did she live here in the villages? No, no, she was in Nashville. Oh, she was in Nashville, okay. And you had friends. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking of retiring and moving to a retirement community? from the information that you've gathered since you've been here. And by the way, how long have you been here in the villages? I've been here two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. Okay. So give some advice to our listeners who might be thinking about moving to the villages. There's a lot of information out there about the villages, some good, some bad. Don't believe whatever you hear and read. Come and visit for yourself. They have these wonderful excursions, so you can come down and check it out yourself. Check all the clubs out. There are... Any number of, I believe there are 3,000 clubs. Over 3,000 right? now, yeah. So whatever you're interested in, you'll find other people who are interested in it as well. I love it here because it is an active community. You don't have to be active. You can sit around and join a book club, go to movies, go out to dinner, and do nothing more strenuous than lift your fork. Or if you want to stay in shape, you can join any one of the gyms around here. You can go walking. You can ride a bike. You can go trail hiking. They're just wonderful people. I, I really have never lived in a place like this. Mm -hmm. My neighbor and I both call it our bubble. Uh, a lot of people call the villages a bubble. It and, is. And in, in some respects, that's true. In some respects, it isn't. We are, the, as retirees, the largest, I believe, retirement community in the country. Mm -hmm. And it's an ever-expanding community. It is. I'm, I'm sad it's getting too big. That was why I left Nashville, because it was getting too big and too expensive. I see the same thing happening here, and that makes me a little sad, but it's, I'll just stay in my little village, and the rest of the place can go expand all it wants to. I have my friends, and I know what I'm doing, and if something new comes along to pique my attention, I'll join that and try it out. Well, good, good. We have uh, always have openings in our improvisational theater club. That's right. I've heard about your club. I think that's fascinating. I've done theater. I did theater when I was in Monaco. Oh, did you? And then I did it again at Vanderbilt. And I've done one play here with my friend, Dr. Linda Succi. And it was great fun. I like being back in the theater. Yeah. Well, improv is even better than theater because there's no learning lines, no hideous rehearsal schedule, and no auditions. No auditions. You just come, play the improv games, and we fit you in based on your talent. Uh, but if you don't have any talent? It's surprising. We, we, we even have some lawyers who have talent. My goodness. One of our best players is a, is a still practicing remotely lawyer. And we've had other lawyers in that have worked out well. We had one that didn't. He had to object to everything. <laughs> the, the rule in improv is accept all offers. If I say, let's go out to Mystic Ice Cream and get some hard ice cream, in improv, you have to say, yes, and. I see. I the, see. This one lawyer kept saying, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, and he, that, that was what killed the scene, so. How can you say no to Mystic Ice Cream? I went out there last weekend. One of my neighbors plays in a ukulele group called Peace, Love, and Ukulele. That that's, makes sense. That's nothing that I would ever have said. I'm going to a ukulele concert. But we had so much fun. Mm -hmm. The entire audience was singing along. We all had our ice cream. The place was packed. Yeah. Uh, the Bohemian Spotlight Cafe, uh, which is the first Saturday of every month from 6 to 9 p.m. at uh, Paradise Recreation Center, is, is like a big open mic night. Uh, tonight's a little unusual. Uh, I've, I've been had my arm twisted, and I'm actually going to do some magic. Ooh. And... We're going to do a couple of improvisational theater numbers as well. And you, you, you see singers who've written songs. You see singers who karaoke a song. Some, some are good. Some aren't. We've had poets, bloggers, even the ukulele band. And the, oh, what's that instrument with strings? The dulcimer? 
the dulcimer. The dulcimer group plays. That's a beautiful name. Yeah. I have a dulcimer. Do you? I do. It was made in Sevierville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to play it? I used to, but I haven't played it in a long time. Yeah, there's, I there's, may have to join the dulcimer club there's, now. There's a club for that, you know. <laughs> know. Basic dulcimer, advanced dulcimer. <laughs> Somewhat seems to be an oxymoron in there, but <laughs> but that's okay. Christy, before we go on with the rest of your episode, which we're going to put into bonus content, I want to thank you for being with us here today and remind our listeners that if they wish to hear the rest of the episode in the bonus content, they can do that through the Apple Podcast Store and subscribe for a big $2.49 a month or $19.99 for a year. Remember, our next episode will air live next Friday at 9 a.m., or should I say pre-recorded, but that's when it will be released on our regular subscriptions. Bonus subscribers can get early access to episodes. Should you want to become a sponsor of the show, contact me at Mike Roth at rothvoice.com. If you know someone that you think should be on the show, send me an email at Mike at rothvoice.com. I want to thank everyone for listening to the show. The content of the show is copyright by Roth Voice 2022, all rights reserved.